Hello everyone and welcome to the History Network Season 26. We made it. We haven't quite hit our Patreon target yet as of going to air with this one, but Angus and I agreed we were near enough to launch this season and we'll see how we are as we go along, hoping we just go from strength to strength. Since the final episode of Season 25 came out last December, we've had a really encouraging number of you sign up at patreon.com forward slash the history network so a huge thanks to all of you david bailey matthew farron neil Carfra, bob farrow scott butterfield vincenzo melisare cole peck cosma catalan dick schreiber david ford adstro igor veinman jeffrey frost yevgen fasenko Towling Fu, Gary Thomas, Russell Davis, Jim Bird, Jeff Kramer, Buzz Flood, and Guy Armstrong. Thank you to you all, and to all those of you who previously pledged to be patrons from this season onwards. Now, if I've missed any names off there, or if you feel I've missed you off a pre previous roll call... Um, of patrons then do let me know and I will be sure to give you credit and to read your name out so um, do let me know if you think I've missed your name but do bear in mind as well that these podcasts are recorded somewhat earlier than their release date so if you're a recent edition then you may hear your name read out uh, subsequently uh, one or two weeks later and from now on, any of you on the Patreon list will be getting this podcast on a Thursday, three days before any non-subscribers. I am also working on getting the back catalogue of the chaptered seasons all ready for those patrons of you who will qualify for unfettered access to our back catalogue. And eventually, if we continue to add patrons and hit our initial target then the Patreon version of the podcast will be ad-free. You can find out all about our Patreon campaign by going to patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash the History Network. If you've got any suggestions about any of that, then do let us know. It's info at the History Network for any questions, queries, suggestions, for scripts, etc. And even though we haven't quite met our initial target yet, we'll probably still be able to pay something to any of you who do write a script for us as a little something, as a way of thank you. But we'll discuss that with any of you who do contribute on an individual basis as we go through the season and see what happens to the Patreon numbers. So there we are. We are here. My voice is ready. I hope your ears are likewise. The History Network, Season 26 Podcasts, Episode 1, Fort Ligonier and the Fall of Fort Duquesne. This episode was written by Doug Nipple. As any regulars of you will know, Doug has written for us before, and he is a high school physics teacher who lives a few miles outside Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Growing up in one of the major areas of early American history, it was only a matter of time before he became obsessively interested in it. Thanks for the script, Doug. In May 1754, a young George Washington's first combat experience occurred at the Battle of Dumonville Glen, located in southwest Pennsylvania in the Ohio Valley where he defeated a small group of French on a diplomatic mission to inform the British that they needed to leave the area. It was French territory and quickly became a flashpoint in the fight for the supremacy of North America. Especially critical was the French-controlled Fort Duquesne, modern-day Pittsburgh, where the Allegheny 
and Monongahela rivers merge to form the Ohio River, which then flows into the Mississippi River and gives a water route to the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic Ocean from the interior of America. Washington was there in turn to inform the French to leave, as well as to construct a road into the area. This incident is often considered the opening battle in the French and Indian or Seven Years' War. Shortly after the action at Dumonville Glen, Washington suffered his first defeat when the French returned to the area in force surrounding Washington and his troops. They forced their capitulation on a rainy night. The next day, July the 4th, the Virginian and British troops abandoned the fort and the area. The next year, in 1755, British Major General Edward Braddock arrived in Virginia. He had been appointed as commander of forces in North America and had a comprehensive plan for a multi-front offensive against the French. This included attacks on the Great Lakes area and the Ohio Valley. Braddock would personally command the attack into the Ohio Valley in an attempt to conquer Fort Duquesne. Braddock's plan was to complete the road that Washington started on his expedition the previous year through a hundred miles of wilderness from Fort Cumberland in Maryland on the Potomac River to Fort Duquesne, modern-day Pittsburgh. After several weeks of road construction and eventually passing the ruins of Fort Necessity, Braddock felt the expedition was moving too slowly. He moved forward with a flying column of about 1,500 men, leaving behind his supply train. This would allow him to make better time reaching and taking Fort Duquesne. On the morning of July the 9th, an advance column from this force ran directly into a French force sent to intercept them. Initially, the French were pushed back by British volleys, but as the fighting continued, the natives allied with the French began to flank the British and fire down on them, from behind cover on the hillsides. The British didn't break ranks and seek cover. They continued to use ineffective volley fire as the natives poured fire into them. Soon panic started to take hold, and the British advance column began to retreat, running into the rest of the force which was coming up to assist. In the dark undergrowth of the forest, thick with musket smoke, the panic became fully realised, and the men dropped their arms and began to flee. General Braddock was wounded early in the battle, and George Washington took over the command role. He was with the expedition as an aide-de-camp to Braddock. Washington was hailed the hero of Monongahela, credited with saving the remainder of the troops. Moving among them and trying to rally a counter-attack, he eventually organised a rearguard action that allowed the survivors to retreat and cross the river and make their way back to the supply column. He was also able to evacuate the wounded Braddock across the river, although Braddock would later die from his wounds. Washington later wrote in his journal that he had at least a dozen musket ball holes in his coat at the end of the battle. At the end of the day, the British lost over 900 killed or wounded out of 1,300 troops. The French and natives lost 40 or 50 killed or wounded, out of about 800, it is proportionally one of the worst defeats of the British army in the 18th century. Again, the British left the Ohio Valley in defeat. It would take three more years until 1758 for their next attempt at wresting control of the area from the French. This time the effort was under the command of General John Forbes, Forbes was in ill health and shared much of the responsibility of command with the very capable Colonel Henry Bouquet. Forbes and Bouquet were ordered by William Pitt to secure the interior of the colonies. This meant ousting the French from the area completely. Infighting between Virginia and Pennsylvania caused some confusion. Infighting between Virginia and Pennsylvania caused some confusion in how exactly this was to be achieved. Each colony wanted the road that Forbes would build to be through their colony for obvious economic reasons. Forbes adeptly made improvements on the existing portions of Braddock's road in Virginia, 
but created his own road across Pennsylvania, constructing a series of forts along the way, so as to have a reinforced supply line. These forts included Fort Littleton, Fort Bedford and Fort Ligonier. All of these forts spawned communities that are still in existence today. At that time they were outposts on the edge of the wilderness. In August of 1758, Forbes sent Major James Grant to construct Fort Ligonier with about 1,500 men. This would be the last fort in the supply line and the closest to Fort Duquesne, about 50 miles away. At its largest, Fort Ligonier would house in and around it almost 5,000 British troops. Grant was then given permission to take a force of over 800 men of the 1st Highland Regiment to do reconnaissance on Fort Duquesne. Grant believed there were only 200 French and natives at Duquesne. In reality, there were four times as many. On September the 15th, Grant laid plans that would attempt to lure the French out of Duquesne to attack by marching a small company of British with drums and pipe as a decoy while a larger force waited in ambush. Unfortunately for Grant, the French and natives poured out of the fort in greater numbers than Grant imagined and overwhelmed the decoy column and the ambush force. The British suffered over 340 casualties, while the French only lost a dozen men, and Grant was taken prisoner. Even after this victory, the French commander of Fort Duquesne, François de Lignery, realised that he could not hold the fort with the thousands of British and colonials still pouring into the territory, and his supply lines cut by the British action in Ontario that captured Fort Potomac in late August of that year. As a result, he dispatched a force of around 400 to harass Fort Ligonier and steal some much-needed supplies and livestock. On October the 12th, the French and native troops began to attack the British sentries in the fields, guarding the livestock. The sentries were driven back towards the fort and the British sent out more troops to reinforce the beleaguered troops. These too were driven back, forced to take refuge in the fort. Inside Fort Ligonier was a good supply of mortar and cannon, and over several hours they were used to drive back the French. Later that evening the French tried once more to assault the British positions, but once more the attack was backed by the superior British artillery. The casualties for the Battle of Fort Ligonier were light, less than two dozen total for both sides. Based on this battle, and Grant's defeat a month earlier, Forbes and Bouquet decided to complete the work on Fort Ligonier, consolidate forces, and postpone any action on Fort Duquesne until the spring, under the assumption the French were stronger than they had originally thought. On October the 16th, George Washington arrived at Fort Ligonier with a group of Virginia militia. These troops assisted with security and late on, November 12th, were sent out to engage some French troops who had stolen a large number of horses and cattle. A dense fog has settled in the area as another group of Virginia militia under George Mercer was sent to assist. Washington had just captured three French troops when his militiamen ran directly into Mercer's men who in the fog and dark mistook each other for the enemy. Both groups fired volleys directly at each other. Washington understood that the targets his men were firing at were not the enemy, and he and several officers moved in front of his men, knocking their muskets upward with their swords. Almost forty officers and men were killed in this incident. Washington wrote about it in one of his journals, relating that he felt this event was the closest he had ever come to death. One of the three men captured by Washington was a British colonial who had previously been captured by the natives and then pressed into service by the French, and he related the very poor condition of Fort Duquesne and the small number of troops. Based on this, and corroborating it with other French prisoners, Forbes and Bouquet decided to launch an attack immediately. The French quickly became aware of the oncoming British attack when pickets reported that the English were marching in force towards Duquesne. On November the 24th, the French commander took the decision to destroy the fort, 
with whatever powder he couldn't save and set fire to the rest. The British heard the explosion when they were still some way off. The next day they arrived to find the fort a pile of smouldering ruins. In the following weeks and months, Forbes and Bouquet undertook to construct a new, larger fort. Forbes named the new stronghold Fort Pitt, after William Pitt, the British Prime Minister. The Seven Years' War continued for several more years, but the combat in Pennsylvania and the Ohio Valley between the French and British was mostly over. The Treaty of Paris in 1763 officially ended the war, but that same year a confederation of Native American tribes, incensed at new policies the British implemented, began what is now called Pontiac's Rebellion. At least eight British frontier forts were destroyed by the natives, and Fort Pitt was put under siege. Fort Ligonier and Fort Bedford, further east, were also sporadically attacked. The siege on Fort Pitt was relieved later that year by a force commanded by Henry Bouquet after a two-day battle at Bushy Run. In 1766, as the native populations in the Ohio Valley were being decimated by smallpox, there was no longer any need for Fort Ligonier, and it was abandoned. A few years later, in 1772, Fort Pitt was also decommissioned and sold to colonists. Fort Ligonier has been faithfully reconstructed on its original plot, and the museum and grounds can be visited. The town of Ligonier still celebrates the Battle of Fort Ligonier yearly on October the 12th, with Fort Ligonier days and battle reenactments. The location of Fort Pitt is now Point State Park, at the confluence of the Monongahela and Allegheny Rivers in modern-day Pittsburgh. You can visit the Fort Pitt Museum on the former site of the fort, where an outline of the location of the fort highlights the green space of the park. Thanks once again, Doug, for sending us in that script, and thank you all for listening. We'll be back in a couple of weeks with episode two of season 26. Do go and check out our Patreon campaign and sign up if you feel like it. Patreon.com forward slash The History Network. Thanks again for listening. You've been listening to the History Network dot org podcast written by Doug Nipple, read by Nick Barker. <laughs>